Hello everybody, my name is Clea and today we're going to be looking at what you hear when you go to the opera, the music. We've already listened to some pieces of music from Purcell's opera Dido and Aeneas, but why don't we have a look in more detail at the different types of music that make up an opera. Yeah. Now this has changed a lot over the hundreds of years that opera has existed, but let's concentrate on the type of music that you might have heard in Purcell's time. Okay. First of all, can anyone remember the main type of song in opera that was inspired by the ancient Greeks? That's right, it's the recitatives. Recitatives are where the singer sings lots of storyline in an almost speech-like way and there is an instrument which accompanies by playing chords underneath. They're called recitatives because they're similar to someone reciting a poem or a story. Let's listen to a recitative from Dido and Aeneas after the fake Mercury tells Aeneas to go to Italy and Aeneas is feeling sad about the fact that he will have to leave Dido. <laughs> Now, what about all the other songs in an opera? Well, the other songs in opera have specific names depending on who is singing, and they're never actually called songs. The most common type of song in an opera is an aria, not an area, which is where one of the main opera singers sings by themselves, accompanied by the orchestra. These are songs that have a small amount of repeated text in them and they give a chance for the singers to really show off their amazing singing skills. There's also something called a da capo aria, which is in two sections. It has a long first section, then usually a short second section with a completely different mood, and finally it goes back to repeat the whole first section all over again. And on the repeat, the singers have the opportunity to make up their own decoration and frills to make their melody line even more elaborate. They do this by adding trills, and fast runs. Another popular way for the singers to show off in arias was with cadenzas. Cadenzas are short sections at the end of arias where the whole orchestra stops and the singer makes up a solo, which is called improvising, before bringing the whole orchestra back in. Over the years, they got more and more elaborate and started to last longer and longer. Let's listen to one really impressive cadenza. Sometimes you also get versions of arias with more than one of the main singers singing. They can be duets with two people, trios with three people, 
or sometimes quartets with four people. Let's take a listen to one of the duets from Purcell's Dido and Aeneas, where the two witches sing. You also get something called choruses in opera. Can you guess what happens in a chorus? Do you know what a chorus is? Well, actually, the word chorus has a few meanings. Sometimes it means the bit in a song that everyone sings along to, which comes after the verse, and usually has simple repeated words in it. But in opera, the chorus means something else. Oh. It's a whole song which is sung by a choir. In fact, in opera, the choir is actually called the chorus. So the chorus sing the choruses, or the choruses are sung by the chorus. Hello. Confusing stuff. So why are choruses important in opera? Well, they're a really good way of showing that people are feeling the same thing. <laughs> the drama may happen to the main characters, but it can be more effective to show the emotion through a group of people. For example, if a king threw a party in an opera, the chorus might represent people of the court who are all rejoicing and being merry. Or it could be used to show the opposite emotion. At the very end of Dido and Aeneas, there's a really beautiful chorus after Dido kills herself, where the chorus sings about angels mourning her death in heaven. Let's have a listen. The recitatives, arias and choruses are the main type of songs in opera. But what else is there? Not all the music in an opera is sung and sometimes just the orchestra play. Quite often composers write short dance movements which might play at the end of one act or at the beginning of another. These short dance movements can be really useful because they give the singers a chance to change costumes and it also gives the stage crew a chance to change the set on stage. The most important thing the orchestra play is at the very beginning of an opera and it's called the overture. This piece of music is so important for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it gets everyone in the mood for the opera that's about to happen. And more importantly, it tells the audience that the opera has begun. Opera audiences in the olden days weren't polite and quiet like audiences these days. The opera was seen as a big social event and the audience would be nattering away and talking loudly, maybe even wandering around the theatre. So when the orchestra started to play, that would be the signal to go and sit in your seats. The overtures would usually have a slow beginning, which would turn into a fast, lively movement. Let's take a listen to the overture from Dido and Aeneas.
Now that we've talked about the different types of pieces in an opera, let's find out a bit about how people wrote them. Purcell was just a young man when he wrote Dido and Aeneas, maybe as young as 19 years old. And in it, he uses one very useful skill really well, repetition. He uses repetition so often because it's a really good way to get people to remember your music. After all, everyone loves a catchy tune and the more times you hear something, the more likely you are to remember it. Purcell was especially good at writing something called a ground bass. A ground bass is a short, repeated pattern that the low instruments like cellos and basses play. And even though all the other musicians play something different each time around, the ground bass just repeats again and again and again. The most famous aria in Dido and Aeneas, When I'm Laid in Earth, is written over a ground bass, which goes like this. This ground bass is quite chromatic, meaning the notes go down in very small steps, giving it that kind of sliding feeling. Let's have another listen to the whole of When I'm Laid in Earth and see how many times the ground bass repeats. Listen carefully.
It happens nine times. There are other ground basses which happen in Dido and Aeneas, which are a bit faster moving, like in Oft She Visits. Let's take a listen to the ground bass. Here the bass line is repeated 13 times. Let's listen to a quick clip of Oft She Visits. There was another skill that Purcell used a lot when writing opera, and that's something called word painting. Word painting is where you try to paint the meaning of a word with music. Let's listen to a few examples of this. In the first clip, you'll hear the low instruments holding long notes to show the still clouds. And then the violins come crashing in to depict the thunder and lightning of the storm. Now we're going to listen to another recitative. Can you hear that Purcell writes big runs on the words storm, valour and fierce? Then he softens the sounds on the word Venus. And on the words woe and soft, he writes slow falling notes. He even makes the word melt sound like it's melting. <laughs> fantastic Erilyn Wallen, who composed all the music for the sequel to Dido and Aeneas, Dido's Ghost. Yay! When I was a little girl growing up in Tottenham, my um, parents had these table mats with people in bright costumes uh, and, and lots of people sort of as if they were dancing. And, and that actually were scenes from the Opera Carmen and that was our table mats. When I look back, I wonder how they had those. You know, when I was about nine, I started piano lessons and I just really took to it. What would happen is I would run out of music to play. I'd, I'd have my piece to play for the week and then I'd quickly learn it. And so then I would go to the library and take out scores, just any old music, to be honest, so I could play something. And one of the bits of music I took from the library was actually... Um, the score for Hansel and Gretel, which actually I didn't see fully staged till, you know, years and years later. But I got used to the idea of words and music. I can't remember the first opera I went to see. I think I was about 15 and it was an opera, funny enough, by Cavalli. So it was, it was an early Baroque opera and I loved it. And I loved the way it was the telling of a myth. The thing with opera is you don't really always fully understand the story. And some of the plots are very, they don't make sense. But there's so many things to watch, the lighting, the costumes, you know, the atmosphere, 
the, um, the interaction between the singers, the interaction between the, um, the instruments and the voices. It's a sort of multi-sensory experience. And I, th I always say to people watching opera, don't try and understand it all, literally. A bit like um, when I was a little girl, I also really loved ballet. I loved watching ballet. And I, to this day, I, I just love the shapes more than the story that's being told. So I remember at school learning Latin and becoming very excited when we were studying Virgil. And I remember this, the story of Dido and Aeneas, the founding of Rome. And trying to understand it in Latin, I was I was really a bit hopeless at Latin, but I did really love it. I love I love the language of it. But that story stood in my head, so I would have been, yeah, from about thirteen. You know these stories. You, everybody's the same. We have these impressions. Childhood is so important because that's where things they may not make fully sense, but they lodge in your brain. And so it was years later, the idea of doing something on the story of Dido and Aeneas, weaving a story of my own into it. The music and the words together have to create the entire atmosphere. So it's very clear what the lighting should be, you know, what the staging should be. So the music should be complete. There's one moment where Aeneas sees the ghost of Dido and she gives him this command, but he doesn't want her to go. And she says, goodbye. And how I set that goodbye is so important. It's just one word, but it has to sum up their whole relationship. And, and what I love is that the music, separate to the words, can plant different seeds and different ideas into our minds. So as I say, opera is multisensory, but it does start in the score where you can tell so many different stories at, at once. And Wesley's libretto is giving me so much. I have to go away and think about how I sow these seeds. And I can't tell you how exciting it is because it uses all of your imagination and you have to, it's driven by the character. So you have to really let them talk to you. The funniest thing is when I was a kid, I would go around the house, throw myself around and singing. And I'd imagine that I was an opera singer, but I seem to, I realize I, I would love to perform in an opera in a way, just really, I've really never done that much acting. And at school, I was always the narrator. So I or had tiny little parts. And I just think I wouldn't mind having a go at singing and acting, except my voice isn't, won't be anywhere as good as the singers that we'll have for our production. Thank you, Erin. That was really amazing. And thank you so much for watching today. I hope you had fun learning all about the music in opera. And don't forget to tune in next week when you'll meet Kristin, who will be talking about what you see on the stage in opera. Bye for now!